Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is 2024 Election Loss for Democrats Require Party Rebuild. It's been one week since the election, and uh, we've, we're seeing in play, of course, that we would know would come. Uh, I call it the circular firing squad. Um, everyone's pointing a finger at everybody else to find out why the, the Harris Waltz team lost as poorly as it did. But nevertheless, it's, it's taking place, and it's taking place for the last week. Uh, we've heard everything from Biden should have gotten out of the race much earlier to the fact that, uh, or, or we've, hear, we've heard that the Democrats took on uh, woke platforms for the, for the party. We've heard it everything of why the loss occurred the way it did. Um, all I can say is that uh, the working class did break for Donald Trump. And those that also were previously Democrats voted for the Republicans. And uh, we could say it's cause effect, but we know that uh, cause effect is never one thing. It's usually a multitude of things that you can point a finger at and say, this caused that. Uh, in this case, I think that's exactly where we're at, is uh, a multitude of things caused the loss for the, for the Democrats in this election. And to discuss that, I have my, my esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton. And our esteemed guest, Ben Davis. Also, our co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning. Jay, to you first. Uh, what do you see as the number one? I mean, I know there's a lot, but what do you see as the number one reason why the Democrats lost? And then second part of this question is, what do you see as the number one response that the Democrat Party needs to initiate in order to attract voters again and win elections. This is going to surprise you, but uh, technology. I've been thinking about it. And I think the Republicans uh, and their friends in Moscow um, got ahead of the Democrats in terms of technology. Because people are, you know, they're carte blanche. They're, they, they're not necessarily educated uh, on either side of the aisle. Um, and you have to try to get into their minds. And the Republicans did that. Trump did that. He got into their minds. And how did he do that? With technology. So if you ask me uh, what I would do to help the Democrats next time around, I would catch up on the technology. I would get ahead of the Republicans on the technology. They've been ahead for some time. Now it's time for the Democrats to catch up and make sure their message reaches everybody, which didn't happen before. I mean, you know, we have concluded that a lot of people in this country voted in ignorance. And the way out of ignorance, at least in the short term, is to educate them. And the way to educate them by the millions is using technology. Okay. Well, let me follow up, because, you know, if you go back to the Nixon-Kennedy debate, um, TV was relatively a new medium for politicians to take to. Uh, would we say that's the same with social media and and podcasts? Uh, look, uh, Donald Trump was ex had exposure to 20 million followers of Joe Rogan, and he had a three hour interview. Uh, that's that's paid political advertising, if if you ask me. And um, Vice President Harris declined going on the Joe Rogan show. So, did social media and podcasting uh, make a difference in this election? Yeah, that's my reference. It's social okay. media, yeah, uh, okay. and it's a podcast, and it's everything, and it's not just the classical ways to communicate, um, like with TV. Although TV is very important, people watch TV. We all got into the habit of watching TV to learn what we could, and I think that's true around the country. But um, query whether you know the Democrats did enough radio. Query whether they did the Joe Rogan thing. Whether they query whether they reached all these various high tech media um, channels um, to reach the electorate, um, I think they had a good message. You know, everybody says, "Oh, she forgot to say this and she forgot to say that," and you know, she didn't frame it right and all this stuff. And we, you know, that's going on and on and on. All, all this, um, you know, mea culpa kind of thing and blame game. Um, but but you know what? I think her message was pretty good, and it was. Um, it was a winning message, I thought. She won me, and I think she won people of of, of like sensibilities. Um, but she did she didn't score in in the voting. 
Why not? Because she wasn't able to educate them, not all of them, and maybe a fraction of them, by not using social media, podcasts, every bloody thing you could find. The other, you know, one one very big concern is that the young people who we had hoped on, counted on, you know, to be the next generation to take us out of the swamp here, <clears throat> they didn't come through. And why didn't they come through? They were listening to other technological choices and not not hers. So again, I come back to um, what you said, social media is one thing, but there's all kinds of social media now. And there's a way of handling social media. And there's a way of putting it out there. It's very high tech. And I think they had the number. Okay. Uh, Chuck, going to you, same question. Uh, what do you think was the primary reason for the election loss for the Democrats? And what do you see as the number one fix or repair uh, that the Democrats should look into uh, at moving forward and certainly for 2026? Well, one of the things, I mean, politics is a business, right? So if you were a business and you were looking at losing your dominant market share and therefore control of the entire market by doing that, hey, you look at what your strengths were that you could build on, you look at where your weaknesses were, and which of those you might be able to improve on, which of those you might want to say, you know, we're not, not going to get those, we're not going to devote our time and our resources there. But we haven't seen any of that kind of analysis. And I'd really like to see it. I'd really like to see where potential strength building opportunities are for Democrats as a political business seeking market share and, and where weaknesses that they can and have to improve on are. I don't think we've done that. I think Jay is exactly right that technology is a means what was used, but the content of the message was that the Republicans staked out inflation and immigration early on, and they took control uh, of those two sectors of the narrative. And they never gave them up. The Democrats never really made any inroads on either one of them, nor did the Democrats with abortion and democracy and other arguments, nor did they offer anything that had the charismatic force that immigration as a fear element and inflation as a life choice threatening element, therefore both fear grounded, had on the electorate. And that's what we saw, I think. <clears throat> so unless they regain some ability to address people on immigration and the economy on inflation, uh, I don't see a shift. Business as usual. Okay, thanks, Chuck. Ben, um, same question to you. Well, um, I'm going to maybe go in a slightly different direction, which is I think there's a presumption that there will be midterms. I'm not convinced that we will have midterm elections based on the kind of government that's being put in place. So I think that given that, when you ask what should the Democrats have done, I'd say that my first answer is you can run an excellent campaign, but you can't run it in 70 days. Uh, you, you really need the, the, the long uh, runway in the United States for people to get comfortable with you. And that ended up being one of the difficulties uh, that were, I think is the heart of it. Um, I'm not, I don't know what would have happened if uh, uh, Biden had stayed on. I understand recently I learned that he actually had COVID on the time of that first debate. Uh, and, you know, so that it was so horrible. Well, yeah, I had COVID and I felt pretty horrible at my age at my age with it um and you know whether he could have possibly kept going i don't know but uh when you switch horses like that with that short period of time i think it's very difficult 
the other thing, uh, looking ahead on this theory that it's not clear we're going to have midterm elections, I think that there is a, a very little time for Democrats to do navel gazing about what went wrong and that they need to, on the contrary, become very aggressive in their resistance to every aspect of what is getting what is being put in place now and in what is going to go ahead i think that um, that and the, how that operates within the whole structure of the democratic party and around the united states i'm not sure but certainly at the state house level and certainly at the national level resistance to every aspect of the tr trump agenda which is essentially a cruel agenda I think is 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 what they have to do and and reorganize themselves on that basis because I do see this as being such a severe threat to the United States uh, based on what is happening right now that essentially we're in the process of being decapitated um, and in a way that I think is uh, very unfortunate as to the looking at the post-mortem for the what happened you have to understand i think that you know the the difference in the vote percentage even though there's the republican majority right now was extremely narrow i think it's one or two percent in terms of the population vote it's not like granted the electoral college does its thing in the numbers like that but if you look at it as in terms of the population it's actually very very close and I think that there are a number of people who voted for Trump who are having buyer's remorse right now because they thought they were doing something that they thought was good and they find out they're doing something that's even worse than Biden. I'm thinking of those folks in places like Dearborn, Michigan. I'm thinking of those folks. You got to understand that the essence of the Republican strategy is to lie to everyone because they don't care about truth. And if you buy into the lie, or you can get you to buy into the lie, that's how they succeeded. That's how they did. They made, I mean, I having spent four years listening to the big lie about the 2020 election and seeing all the layers of lying that went on in this particular election about what was it? Haitians eating cats and dogs. What was let's, let's pick a couple of them along the way. Uh, you know that the thirteen thousand people who killed, uh, who are murderers, that are immigrants, or all during the Biden administration when it goes back forty years. All those kinds of lies were used and effectively done to do what? To work on the fear, the fear emotion in people, right? And the fear emotion is a strong emotion. And so you have to counter that fear emotion in some way that is meaningful to people. Uh, and quite honestly, I think that the way you counter it is by resisting the nonsense uh, and, and, and really having the courage to not bend the knee in front of all this that's being pushed at us to just be compliant with what's going on. Let me interrupt right there if yeah. I may. I mean, didn't the Harris waltz team do their best to call out the lies and, and and tell the American public, hey, come on, these have been lies for years. And didn't they try to do that? To me, yes. But again, they had a short runway, 70, 78 days, while there's been three and a half, three and a half to three and three quarters years of Trump, because he started running from the day after the election um, uh, that happened in 2020, I believe. Um, to 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 put the lies out there, and so um, now I you know every single little sort of key you want to play on in the American subconscious was carefully played on to uh, by by the Republicans in in ways that the Ameri the Democrats uh, maybe didn't play as well. I, I personally thought that the <laughs> Americans uh, that the Democrats did not communicate very well the you know, we're getting money to you kind of vision in a way that Trump was able to do. He's a salesman, right? But the, the language was used was not maybe strong enough. But 
I really don't hold too much against the uh, the uh, Harris campaign simply because I thought they ran about as good a campaign as you could, but you just had 78 days, and that wasn't enough time for people to get comfortable with, one, okay. a woman, and two, a black Indian woman, mm -hmm. so that they would vote, they would go that way. As well, didn't it ultimately, didn't it, I mean, again, cause effect. Um, yeah. we, we look at a multitude of things. Uh, the last show, I asked you that specific question. Did the fact that she was a female and uh, was uh, black and had Indian descent as well, wasn't that a, a, a big factor in why she didn't get the votes that she probably was hoping for? Uh, um, I mean, personally, I would say absolutely in america i mean absolutely let's not be naive right we all understand that you know in fact one of the most fascinating comments i heard recently today was from a, a friend of mine who's white and he said he feels bad for white men right now mm -hmm. because they're going to be looked at as the bad guys even because three out of five of them voted for trump right well you know that's two out of five who actually voted against trump right but, right. the, you know, they're they're going to be put into this amalgam. And it's like half and half with white women, right? Well, there's especially if you're over 50 years old. I mean, right. yeah. I think there's certain assumptions being made, stereotypes being made about white males uh, over 50. I you're know. right. And, 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 I, and I'm, what I'm trying to say is that that kind of uh, showed me, at least, that there was a lot of openness, actually, but just not enough. You know, there's a long history that he's going to get up against. And, you know, literally every single uh, trope that's used, uh, she's, you know, got the immigrant thing is kind of speaking to her, her being black, uh, her, a woman. I mean, I, Trump almost used the B word about her. I mean, that's the level that this went to. And, well, he, did, uh, he did call her shitty. Thanks, Ben. I'm going to go to Jay here. Um, Jay. You know, there's always a, a statement that all politics starts local. And, um, you know, both parties, uh, Democrats, Republicans alike, have the use of think tanks and consultants to help shape their policies and platforms. Uh, there seems to be, in the last week, a lot of the local politicians, particularly out of the, the swing states, uh, particularly out of Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, where the politicians are saying, hey, uh, this is not what we're hearing as effective means to persuade the, the electorate to vote Democrat. Is it time for the Democrat Party to wean itself off some of these think tanks and consultants and start listening to the local elected politicians for how they should form their platforms and policies in the future? Uh, or is that just a false assumption? No, that, I think that's a good assumption. Um, I, I think you know the Democrats played um, uh, the classical game, and the, the classical game is over. Trump has changed the classical game. The Republicans have changed the, the classical game. One one thing that comes to mind is uh, I mentioned before about technology. Well, um, you know the Republicans uh, were more of one voice, Trump's voice, and um, the Democrats were pretty fragmented. I mean, I was getting hundreds of emails a day uh, from various Democrat candidates around the country, and it was a huge turnoff. And I thought to my all asking money, all you know, screaming alarms and all this, but it wasn't coordinated in any way. And um, I, I was waiting, hoping that somebody, some organization would emerge as the one who was talking to me, but it never happened. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking, well, that was my reaction. You know, maybe I'm on the, on the, the blue side of things, but I think a lot of people must have reacted in the same way. This is not organized. This is, this is chaotic requests for money. And had it been more organized, and again, technology could help. It was helping in the Trump camp. Um, you know, then the Democrats would be in better shape. The other thing I, I want to mention is that. <clears throat> You know, Trump accentuated these racist tropes that Ben is talking about and the misogynistic tropes. He accentuated it. And she played, you know, she played civilized. Um, you know, when he went low, she went high. 
And I'm not sure that was a good idea, actually. When somebody does that to you, you have to respond. It's the it's the seventh grade schoolyard kind of a thing. You can't just, you know, turn your back on that. You have to deal with it. <clears throat> so um, in addition to the fact that she was late, Biden was late getting out, only allowed her 70 plus days to do a campaign. I think she did a remarkable you know, job in that time, but not good enough because there wasn't enough time. When they said, I don't really know her, they were saying, A, that, that Biden didn't let her out, of, out to do her thing during the first uh, three years. And secondly, <clears throat> that Biden got out late, so they didn't know her. But I think Trump was, you know, criticizing her as a woman. And that was really important. That is a, actually, uh, I think it's more important, you know, than the racist thing. I think she could have got by that if he didn't demean her as a woman. And I'm really sad to say, and, and you know, we did commentaries here on Think Tech about that. Um, sad to say that a lot of women voted against her. What was on their minds? You know, the American electorate is not only ignorant, but they have a bad case of amnesia. They can't remember what he did for four years. They can't remember what he did in the insurrection. Um, and, and he was able to starkly identify her, her femaleness as a, as, a, as a plank in his, uh, you know, and, and she should have responded. Perhaps a man would have responded more aggressively. I keep thinking of Gavin Newsom. You know, what would he have done? Well, he would have responded. And all of us here on this show would have responded. She was playing, you know, let's go high when they go low. And that does not appeal to the American electorate. So he was able to use his salesman you know, and his technology uh, in, order to, in order to beat her back. And that was too bad because, you know, obviously, I mean, there's no question rationally, she is a far better candidate than he ever was on his best day. And yet this country voted against her. <clears throat> Finally, um, she wasn't the leader of the down ballot campaigns. And a lot of them lost because there was no leadership that that worked for them, that made it happen for them at the top. And I don't mean just Kamala. I mean the chair of the Democratic Party, um, the group, whoever was running the Democratic Party, they kind of left it to the Lincoln Project. My God, that's not enough. <clears throat> so I think what happened here is, uh, among other things, a failure of leadership. And that's why the Democrats lost both houses. OK, thank you. Chuck, I want to tag on to something Jay said here, and that is, uh, the Democrats are usually accused of being fragmented and they're, they, 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 they direct their messages to specific groups, be it the Hispanics, be it uh, uh, African-American group, be it to um, uh, the woke uh, sector of the Democrat party, the extreme progressives. Um, and, and to some degree, the criticism I've heard in the last week was, can't they just talk to Americans as Americans? and not try to target their messages to every select um, sector of the Democrat Party or the American population. Do you think there's any merit with that criticism of the Democrat Party, that um, they tried to segment the market and target their messages to the market, and hopefully they don't offend any part of those markets, and maybe they just should think about um, the working class, the middle class, those that are having a, you know, a tough time with economics at the and how to figure out how to pay their bills at the kitchen table. Your thoughts? Well, I think it's a good insight, Tim, and a good question, because if you're going to be a Democratic Party representing and advocating for democracy, hey, you're going to be open to all planks, all perspectives. It's just inherent in your approach. You can't wall them out because that's who you are. But there's a couple of things going on here that the media haven't picked up on. One, neuroscience tells us a lot about exactly what Jay was talking about, is the Republicans use technology to do what's called hijacking the amygdala, the dinosaur brain, the reptile brain, whatever you want to call it, the fear-oriented brain, the one that 
the thinking fast brain. <laughs> and the Democrats never managed to get connected to the thinking more deliberatively brain. <laughs> there is, and a friend pointed this out, <laughs> there is an area which the Republicans have neglected that the Democrats may be able, if they galvanize, to bring about some change for the future in. And that is to focus on educating children to think expansively, to think critically, to think evaluatively, to take in information and to weigh it as objectively as possible. We need to really, really focus on teaching our children to do that. If uh, Donald Trump demolishes the Department of Education? Yeah, because it, that's a community thing. That happens where the 60s movements for civil rights and peace came from. They came from the communities, they came from the schools, the faculty, the parents, the rest of the communities came in and joined those forces, those movements, because they were consistent with their values as people, as parts of those communities. So what the Democrats have missed is, if you really want to connect with the community, you have to be part of that community, and you have to be part of its learning process. You can't be teaching, you have to be sharing the learning so that it can move forward to see and make better choices. Okay, thank you, Chuck. Uh, we're almost out of time, so I think this is a good time to ask for final comments. Uh, ben, let's start with you and your final thoughts. Uh, my th final thoughts are that uh, this is not an either or, it's a both and kind of situation. I mean, the longer term type things that have been described with regards to technology, as well as uh, stopping the dumbing down of Americans, um, it certainly, I think, is important. Um, I do, however, have the view that we are in a time where resistance is crucial against a project that is probably trying to take us back 100 years. Carl Bernstein said that essentially what's going on right now is to move back to before FDR. That's And they're serious about moving back before FDR. So if you remember the America of the 1920s, which none of us do, but we do remember the Depression, that's what they want. That And that if that is something you want, fine. But I don't believe that the uh, Americans who voted the way they did actually want that or understood that at the time. So my thing is that the Democrats should do some navel gazing, but mainly they should be resisting everywhere they can whatever is coming out of this administration. Because if they don't resist, everyone will acquiesce. All right, thank you, Ben. Uh, Jay, to you. Yeah, you can already see the signs of acquiescence, actually, that's that's a very telling comment, Ben. Um, no, I was talking about you know technology and communication. I don't think we're gonna be able to train a generation of Americans to, um, you know, to be more, careful about this sort of thing. Um, but I do think if there's one piece of advice I would give the Democratic Party, and, and that's what you're really asking about, Tim, is um, they better get on top of the media thing. I think the media failed us. Uh, they, they failed to make it clear that, that Trump was out of his mind, unhinged, and all that. Now, the cable, the cable shows that we like so much, they made it entertainment. <clears throat> there was a lot of... Um, you know, making fun of him. The late night uh, guests were really brilliant. The, the late night shows really brilliant. But again, it was entertainment. It wasn't serious. Fox News was lying all the time and they were serious. Um, the New York Times had their priorities wrong. The Washington Post, both of whom are syndicated around the country, had its priorities wrong. And they did this balanced reporting which is you know, also out of the 20s and 30s. It's old news, <laughs> if I can say that. Um, they, they have to get their act together. They, did, they failed us, I'm sorry. Um, and I think what the Democrats have to do is get on top of that. that why can't there be 
um, a mirror reflection of Fox News on the Democrat side, uh, run by the DNC or some proxy of the DNC, where they attack Trump all day long where they bring it out real serious and give you facts and figures to help you understand, where they educate those other generations that were uneducated. Um, the Democratic Party has to educate people, and they need to do that now, because they're going to be working against Trump, who is going to try to take advantage of his power and dumb down the media, intimidate the media, um, you know, undermine the First Amendment. I think he's going to work really hard on that because that's in his way. And I agree that there's an issue about what's going to happen uh, in, in, the, in the midterms, what's going to happen the next presidential election. We are about to lose it, ladies. Uh, we, we are about to lose our democracy, and he's going to use all the levers of power. You can see that coming in his cockamamie appointments that he's been making every day. Um, imagine Matt Gates as the attorney general of the United States, that is no more nor less than a clown car. Uh, so I, I, you know, I'm very afraid uh, that the media is not going to belly up to that. The Democrats' first order of business is to develop its own media and to speak its mind and do the resistance you're talking about through that and coordinate and avoid the fragmentation through that. Chuck, last word on this topic. You know, I come back to. There's a wonderful civil rights era song from 60 plus years ago called Sweet Honey in the Rock. Ben knows about that one. Written by Ella, what was her last name, Barnes? I don't remember. Something I don't remember like that. that. <clears throat> but the chorus, which gets stronger and stronger and stronger as the congregation sings it and starts to feel its power, is we who love freedom cannot rest. Who is we? There is no we. That's been demonstrated on election day. There is no we, not as far as the Democrats are concerned. It has to be a leader. It has to be somebody singing that song. All right. Well, you encouraged me to make a last comment, too. Thank you, Jay. Um, I think only a week has passed, and we're starting to see some voter buyer remorse. And specifically, I'll cite uh, Dearborn, Michigan. And we had a, 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 one of the prominent community leaders of the um, Muslim population of Dearborn, Michigan, say that they bought a lie. They didn't realize that Donald Trump had lied to him so efficiently. 18% uh, voted for Jill Stein in that state. 42% voted for Donald Trump. And 38% voted for uh, Vice President Harris. Uh, when Donald Trump appointed uh, former Governor Huckabee, as the ambassador to Israel, and in one short day of his appointment or his nomination by Trump, he said that there is no Palestine, and of course, the West Bank should be annexed by Israel. Um, I think that population that couldn't, they couldn't hold their nose long enough to vote for Harris Walt's team and voted for Jill Stein are finding out the hard way that um, Donald Trump is not what he says and not who you think he is. And with that, we'll conclude. I want to thank my special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, Ben Davis, and my co-host, Jay Fidel. This is American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apichel, your host. And until next week, aloha.